So welcome and, uh, to this uh, new podcast of the Robertly Beneficial uh, Group. Uh, and today we're going to discuss uh, a blog post by uh, Jürgen Schmidt Huber, uh, who's one of the he's the, he's the one of the most influential uh, researchers in in uh, deep learning in particular, and he uh, co-inventor uh, inventor of the uh, LSTMs. And uh, he wrote this blog post about uh, AI versus COVID-19, asking uh, about what are the ways that uh, deep learning in particular, or deep learning kinds of methods, can be helpful uh, in the fight against uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and so today we're going to discuss, uh, so he basically he listed uh, three points, and today we're going to add two more <laughs> to this list. Uh, so first we'll be discussing uh, uh, ideas uh, related to uh, contact tracing or global scale, uh, like law, uh, population scale uh, tracing. Uh, then we're going to discuss uh, uh, single patient uh, diagnosis or methods uh, used to uh, better understand the health condition of, uh, of an individual. Uh, number three will be, uh, point number three will be uh, drug discovery uh, and everything that's related to the search of uh, useful molecules. And then uh, number four, we'll uh, discuss one of our favorite topics, which is uh, recommender systems, uh, whose role I think is uh, extremely neglected uh, in this crisis. And, and then we also uh, discuss uh, things related to uh, epistemology or moral philosophy, that uh, computational thinking and probabilistic thinking are probably useful uh, for. And these are fields that uh, are highly researched uh, by AI researchers. Okay, so we already discussed uh, concerning uh, tracking populations, the, the use of uh, contact tracing for individuals. Yep. Uh, the, the idea behind contact tracing is to be able to faster uh, detect who is at risk of being infected or not by the, by the virus and to make them be tested or help them uh, put themselves in quarantine to, to stop the propagation. Another idea that was very important was that uh, epidemiolo epidemiologists should have access to, to better data to be able to, uh, to estimate uh, quickly the reproduction number over time. And uh, this is especially important if we start to, uh, to stop the confinement because uh, every decision we take to, to reopen uh, schools or cinemas uh, will have an impact on the reproduction of parameter of the of the of the epidemic, and we want to very quickly be able to to have this estimation. So, we have said uh, last week that uh, contact tracing, uh, a contact tracing app, could be a, a, a great asset for epidemiologists to collect this kind of data to quickly estimate the reproduction factor. But uh, if we don't have this kind of data, there are actually other sources of data that could be used. Uh, we discussed, for example, uh, simply cameras in a, in, a, in metro station or bus stations to count how many, how many people pass by. So today, because of the global quarantine, there must be a, a very small number of, of people using this. But I expect that epidemiologists could find a relations between uh, how many people are outside and uh, traveling in a in transports and uh, the amount of, uh, of contact people have and uh, the, the propagation of the disease. So all of this, uh, so simply c collecting uh, this data, making it available to epidemiologists to be able to, uh, to have better estimation of the, of the rate of uh, reproduction. Yeah, uh, but all of these points, like there, there's uh, like in the blog post, there are mentions of uh, current uh, work, uh, um, and well, I guess most of it is uh, not peer reviewed at all because uh, well, uh, it's uh, we're in crisis mode and it takes time to to write and, and uh, review uh, papers, uh, but th these are like actionable ideas with uh, research that can be done, but it's not guaranteed that they will be uh, extremely efficient. Uh, uh, what's interesting is that um, if you want to do this while well, you, well, overall, if you want to do AI, if you want to do machine learning, then uh, you absolutely need a, a lot of data. Uh, machine learning is only uh, successful if you can gather a lot of uh, 
uh, of data of quality data and uh, a, a lot of uh, data in terms of quantity as well. Um, what's interesting is that uh, some, uh, especially uh, Facebook in particular, has been uh, uh, addressing more and more this issue. They have launched uh, something called uh, data for good that fb.com where they trying to uh, work with uh, academics to try to set up uh, databases that can be useful for for this kind of work and typically one thing you can do as mentioned in the in the blog post is that uh, you can try to predict the next uh, contaminations uh, uh, for 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 like where, where there's going to be uh, the next uh, outbreak uh, and if you can do this, this can be extremely useful to uh, for policy. Like you can uh, accelerate the policy uh, making to contain the the, the outbreak. Uh, it can be also useful to uh, organize uh, the, the the response. And typically, uh, uh, given that the resources currently are, are limited in terms of uh, of material resources like ventilators, but also in terms of human resources uh, like doctors. Uh, it's important to know where they could help the most, and this kind of, uh, of large-scale uh, predictions can be extremely uh, useful for this. Uh, yeah, I, I like. I, I want just to add. Um, so I, I was waiting for you to, to like to finish explaining point one actually, which we address uh, in the in the episode on uh, on um, on contact tracing. Uh, I just I just note something which is uh, very common um, in academia, and especially now in these days of crisis, the 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 the, the, the like bubbles of communities. Uh, I, I went through the Ellis workshop. I didn't see any mention of DP3T or, um, or 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 uh, or robot like initiatives from from peer to peer and. Uh, so, like the the, the initiatives uh, such as DP3T or uh, the Inria one and the Front of one uh, robot uh, didn't make it to the to the radar of, of of the machine learning community at least up to the date of the of of, of this workshop, and I think that's also something that uh, that um, should be highlighted and that may may make save time and if 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 we just had some channels such as such that people don't reinvent the wheel, each one, each one in each community in its uh, in its in its corner. I don't know if the, the idea is clear. So you you, you see that yeah. you see that like there was the, there was this effort on on developing peer to peer contact tracing, and then you had people within the machine learning community doing it on their side and and uh, probably losing some time by 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 not being aware of what is done already in the peer to peer design. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm guessing that by now they've heard of uh, heard. such, uh, such mm. projects. I, I hope so. Uh, yeah. uh, one thing that would be interesting is uh, how to exploit the data from uh, contact tracing because uh, uh, so at least in GP3T, mm. uh, users can also agree to share the data in an anonymized way mm. with uh, epidemiologists. So this can uh, give additional data about how people interact, like how often, uh, at least uh, what is the number of contacts that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, DP3T users have per day, and is it uh, increasing over time? Uh, yeah, th these are, I think, interesting and uh, important data to, to analyze, like uh, what is the proximity, like should we uh, ask them to be more socially distant and such like this. Uh, yeah, this would probably make up a, a nice database to be analyzed uh, by uh, machine learning uh, researchers. Point number two was about uh, like uh, focusing on individuals and uh, given uh, an individual, can we, for instance, uh, predict if uh, he is uh, already contracted the, the, the COVID-19? Like ideally, you would want to diagnose this uh, even before the person has a symptom, which sounds extremely hard and probably won't be uh, doable, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but there are more important, well, there are other perhaps easier questions that you can ask, maybe by observing some uh, biometric data of individuals, um, uh, you can uh, yeah, give some probability estimate of whether he's uh, more likely to have uh, the COVID or not, but whether he 
yeah, the disparity is large enough so that he should stay at home. Uh, there's also some interesting work about uh, trying to predict uh, if a uh, already sick patient is going to have a critical condition within two hours, for instance, uh, because one of the things that's uh, really uh, terrible about uh, COVID-19 is that uh, the patient can be, feel fine for a long time. And, and then uh, all out of sudden, all, all out of sudden without uh, warnings and uh, without doctors predicting it, uh, in just a matter of a few hours, uh, the, the patient can be critically ill and even die. So if you can predict this two hours ahead of time or a few hours ahead of time, then it can be extremely useful to prepare a response for these uh, critical conditions. So there has been apparently already work uh, done on this. Uh, that's uh, really interesting. You can analyze all sorts of all the uh, data that are collected uh, in hospitals to do this, uh, or to uh, better predict uh, if the patient is fine to be released or, or things like this. Uh, there are, there, there's uh, some more, uh, uh, let's say unusual uh, kind of approach. Uh, so, so all of this is is very nice, but it only works if the the, the patient is already in the hospital. And as we we know, uh, uh, hospital being overwhelmed is already a problem. So you don't necessarily want people more people getting in the hospital to get this kind of diagnosis. So instead, uh, what they what people have been like uh, these AI researchers have been trying to propose is like solutions to help people diagnose uh, COVID-19, but with very limited data, for instance, typically data collect that can be collected from your phone. Because if you can do this, then uh, essentially anyone could use his phone to, uh, to uh, like a lot of people can use their phones to, uh, to have a, a better estimate of their health conditions. And this allows to bypass the, the medical uh, uh, institutions that are already overwhelmed. So that's very interesting. Uh, now the the main uh, idea that uh, that uh, about this is quite unusual. It's about uh, uh, analy uh, analyzing the sound, the the, rec the the sound recording of someone coughing. Uh, if uh, apparently, uh, according to the paper, apparently uh, COVID nineteen is attacking is attacking the lungs differently from other uh, uh, diseases that attack the lungs. And so, because of that, apparently there, 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 there could be biological reasons mm -hmm. uh, for which uh, people cough differently depending on the disease they have. Even acoustic reasons. Yeah. 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 And so, the idea of the app is to analyze this. And uh, uh, if you have a lot of data, this is a very classical uh, supervised learning problem. Like you have a lot of people coughing. And if you can get the label, if you can uh, know if they were uh, afterwards, if they were or even before and if they are positive to the COVID-19 or to another disease, uh, then this is like classical supervised learning and this can uh, be helpful to uh, diagnose, uh, to determine based on the cough if someone is more likely to be having uh, COVID-19 or, or some other disease. So the, the, the people I saw commented on this from the medical and biological communities tend to be skeptical. So just uh, mm -hmm. this caveat. Yeah. Um, so I, I believe there are reasons to be skeptical. Uh, yeah. Because we have a track record of of of, uh, of overhyped apps in AI, etc. But I also think there are reasons to be indulgent and less skeptical. Uh, when we think about how indulgent we are with non-AI diagnosis, so to say. Uh, so we we tend to be uh, we tend to ask for. Uh, like we, we tend to raise the standard sometimes. Uh, I'm, I'm quoting, uh, so there's this pro professor at Virginia Tech uh, uh, and uh, she, she, she was saying that um, we, we tend to, um, uh, uh, we, we, yeah, we, t we tend to just raise, uh, raise the, 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 the standard with AI. Uh, so, so like obviously this app wouldn't be uh, bulletproof. It would have a lot of issues. And as you said, it needs a lot of data that we might not have yet from patients. And it might even need data from patients when they had symptoms and when they didn't have symptoms so on the same patient so that you don't, uh, you don't start uh, learning uh, something that has not 
anything to do with COVID, but just like with, with populations. Like you start learning how old people cough because old people are overdiagnosed than, than, than young people. So instead of learning how COVID make you cough, you start learning how old people cough compared to young people. And, um, but yeah, yeah, we, te we, tend, we tend to remember, uh, to forget that, uh, that we have also very uh, much uh, this with, uh, with human diagnosis. Like with pneumonia, you can lose a week if your doctor uses a stethoscope and, 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 uh, and she or he doesn't send you to, uh, to do an x-ray while, while you needed it because she or he taught from the stethoscope that you don't need to do an x-ray because there's nothing apparently. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we need to be careful about the, this uh, this uh, paper. Uh, it will have to be uh, probably more tested. I, I think they need uh, maybe approval from uh, from the FDA. Of, I don't know how it works uh, exactly, but uh, it, it, like if it has a lot of uh, huge weight of false negative or false positive, uh, it can be uh, a problem. Yeah. Um, well, they have a lot of, uh, well, they did a lot of experiments and, and, and testing and according to their results, like it's really, really promising according to what they've published. Uh, but of course, uh, they've only analyzed the people probably coughing in certain conditions, maybe uh, you know, in given hospitals using some, some specific uh, recording devices. Um, it's not yet clear that this will uh, generalize to, uh, to uh, applications on everyone's phones. Uh, but what I, I found interesting in this paper is that they were very really careful about, uh, especially false, uh, uh, so, so like uh, reporting that someone is not likely to have the COVID-19 when he actually has the COVID-19. I think it's very important that this priority is very low because you don't want to, to, to allow, like to encourage people to be careless uh, if they actually have the COVID-19. So uh, yeah, the, the problem, well, according to the data, like the priority, uh, this priority is like very, very, very low. It's like, uh, like very, very, very low. You can get the paper, it's like less than, I think it's one, around like one per million, but it's probably not re that reliable as a number, but it's indicative of the efforts uh, they've made. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's uh, that's interesting. And, and the app also can, could do some, just re reply uh, test inconclusive. So it can be like I don't. It shouldn't be thought as uh, a diagnosis, but it can be a, a, a help to say uh, to some people. Oh, this is like you sound a bit uh, like you, you should be very careful. Get tested. Maybe maybe this could also help to prioritize tests because uh, uh, testing uh, is uh, is limited. Uh, so we cannot test everyone. And we have to prioritize, and uh, really, it, it makes sense to to prioritize those who are more likely to be at risk. Yes, for this kind of app, uh, I think they have a very high potential to do good. Uh, the the one detecting uh, uh, COVID nineteen uh, through uh, listening to coughs, but also um, other apps like uh, using the heart rate. We know from uh, smartwatches uh, can measure this or the breathing patterns. And uh, one thing that we should be very careful about is that we should uh, be able to anticipate the the reaction that people would have to uh, to diagnosis from such a such an app. For example, we 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 will necessarily expect that there is some uh, percentage of uh, false positive or false negatives. And if, for example, uh, the the app has two percent of false positive, then we don't want that two percent of the population would go to the hospital for, for, for no reason. That, uh, that could be a, a, a very negative side, side effect of, uh, of using this kind of app. So yeah, there is a, uh, a discussion to have and uh, we're uh, thinking about not only improving that app to make it uh, as, uh, as good as possible to detect uh, the, the diseases, but also uh, anticipate the reaction of uh, people to this kind of diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and again, like these are classical problems of uh, robust machine learning. Like you want the results to be robust. In particular, I think here the, the, the greatest danger is uh, probably a distributional shift, um, like the data that people will be uh, sending through their phone is maybe not the one that the app was trained on. Uh, but again, uh, if you want to 
to to solve this problem, like uh, getting more data is, is critical. And they mentioned it in this, this paper, like if more and more people use the app, the app can improve. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and it's hard to predict how, how well it will be. Uh, but maybe it's, uh, well, I, I think it's worth investigating more uh, this possibility uh, while being careful. But uh, I think a, a bit of exploration here is needed. Yeah, and one other aspect that you mentioned is uh, for the app to be able to to simply answer that uh, I'm not able to make a diagnosis instead of yeah. saying uh, positive or negative. Ah. Uh, this is something that's uh, a topic often discussed in, uh, in terms of AI safety, that uh, when uh, machine learning models makes prediction to be able to be, to also have a measure of how sure the model is of its own prediction. And yeah. I think it's something that uh, a human doctor would be doing. Uh, if you know if the human doctor analyzing you would either know for sure that you have no problem, know for sure that you have a problem, or uh, know that he doesn't know and uh, push you to towards a different test, uh, different doctors, specialists, and that's yeah, that, and uh, that's something that would be desirable for this kind of apps. I guess. So yeah, the, this is um, so this relates not only to to the, to the back end design but also to the to the the front end like. Uh, people in computing tend to forget that we we, we need to have a, a standard where it's like we, we need to have a world where the standard is not yes or no, but you have a nuance. Like you have a, mm -hmm. a spectrum telling you, uh, just like your doctor might tell you, she, she, she would tell you, okay, uh, I think you have a pneumonia or I, I think you don't have a pneumonia. Or she can tell you, look, you are in that range where we don't know, so you might have a... A bacterial pneumonia or it might just be a bronchitis so let's take an x-ray uh, so, so so maybe we, we should think of designing apps where you always have this spectrum of 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 um, of, um, of likelihoods and just tell the user yes you you fall in this region of, of yes you fall in this region of no or you are in this broader area of, of doubt and maybe you you better go to the doctor now Cool. So we can move on to number point number three. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, drug discovery, uh, trying to find molecules that are promising for for curing the the COVID nineteen. Um, so so that has been uh, interesting work in, in this era. For instance, so you can have a better understanding of the the functions of different proteins, uh, and proteins are what are going to what well, they're they're doing the job uh, at the molecular level level, so it's uh, important to understand uh, how, how they behave. There has been advances, uh, especially from Google DeepMinds and um, something called uh, AlphaFold, uh, about uh, yeah better predictions of protein folding. Uh, there has been also uh, work using uh, graph neural networks to understand uh, the the similarities and the connections between uh, different molecules. Um, so yeah, this, this is, uh, is all like research that has been done uh, in the background for, for years. Uh, now they've kind of put to the test uh, in an urgent manner. Uh, so I don't know that much about the field, but uh, I do know it's extremely difficult uh, for the same reasons that it's very difficult for humans to be discovering uh, the right molecules. And uh, and also like there's no, I don't think we should, I, I think one, a uh, dangerous fallacy would be to think that we're searching for the the, the miracle molecule. Uh, like, I think it's unlikely that there's going to be this one molecule that whenever people are, who are in critical condition take it, they suddenly uh, saved. Um, like talking to doctors, it seems that what they hope for is more like something that reduces the probability of, of dying. And if it reduces by, by 10% uh, is already good. Uh, if it's by 50%, it's a miracle. Uh, like, yeah. So I think this should be tr stressed that, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's not going to be a me medical drug, uh, probably, very, very probably not. Yes, uh, the way this kind of research uh, works is that uh, the virus has some sort of, uh, of, of, of molecule that he, he uses to, uh, to stick into the, the human body and uh, and uh, what uh, a neural network like AlphaFold, and uh, I think there are there are others that uh, the correctly predict uh, the interactions between uh, different molecules. Try to 
this kind of neural, with this kind of neural network, we can test a, a billions of uh, molecules very quickly to to test whether whether we think that they would be interacting with the with the virus or not. And uh, and what uh, one way that this can be used is to not uh, not make a final decision, but uh, decide on which molecule are have a higher priority to be tested in a in a lab uh, by a uh, chemist and a biologist. So out of one billion, we could think that it selects one only one thousand molecules that are better candidates for uh, that we think will be more successful at uh, at interacting with the virus. And uh, and this kind of speed up drastically the the work of, uh, that is happening in labs. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen also work about uh, trying to predict uh, side effects from uh, using the similarities uh, between uh, different molecules, and and this can be also uh, useful uh, to try to yeah to predict the, the side effects because we, like so, some of the like the most powerful treatments are also those with the most uh, side effects. Uh, simply because if they want to be powerful, they need to, to change a lot of things in, in the human body, and and uh, yeah, this, this often leads to important side effects. So you need to find the right balance between uh, uh, helping to cure the disease and not having too bad side effects. And yeah, this, this kind of work can also be useful, uh, uh, especially as we said, like to prioritize uh, some uh, molecules to to do research on them over other molecules. Yeah, the, the good work that has been done on this area previously is uh, also building a databases of, uh, of known uh, molecules and uh, known interactions between uh, between molecules and, and these databases are very valuable. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll that's that uh, maybe this, this is the, the out of the five directions maybe this is this is where uh, the machine learning and AI community does not yet have anything ready to use. So this is this is where we have the least ready to use things. So like th those things are like uh, AI for drug design, AI for molecules, etc. This is something still very, very, very premature. And I think it's worth yeah worth investing in data sets. Just just put in efforts in in data sets because that's the first thing you have to put. Not, you don't do anything else before having enough data sets like the 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 applications of machine learning of in, in in image recognition wouldn't wouldn't have happened if if the data set image net was not there so i would okay. say i would say 90 percent of the, the efforts that led to the current use of machine learning in image recognition was was gathering image nets more than more than the algorithmic part yeah yeah and this is a direction where and I think this is a direction where chemists and and biochemists should should join the effort to increase the the scale of data sets. Yeah, yeah, we, we talked about this also uh, a few days ago. But uh, the 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 way data is collected in hospitals uh, can be improved. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say just important. like this. Oh, sure. And if you and I think it's really important to gather this data because these these data uh, can be extremely useful to better understand uh, the spread of the pandemic and how urgent it is to take further measures, the wow. number of tests that are run. Uh, yeah. This is extremely important to estimate and the number of actual cases in the population. Yeah, um, yeah all of this like having better information systems is critical because information is critical these days uh, and uh, so, so some, some people might not realize how much low tech uh, the world is going through with covid with uh, up to 20 ish of march uh, in the official news channel the official television like the the national television of switzerland uh, reported that um, covid uh, uh, covid deaths and cases still need to be reported by, via fax so uh, 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 yes, yeah, so it's not only that, but even cases. So positive cases up to twenty March or to twenty. Uh, I don't know if it changed since then, but uh, and I would see. I would, I would. I'm afraid it's less likely to change. Like given the some of these things depend on uh, legal aspects that are very heavy, and uh, so very established and hard to change. And, uh, so yeah, cases needed to be reported via fax.
And, uh, this 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 just creates a bottleneck on on knowing just the number of people that are infected. Yeah, we we the, like it just creates uh, it slows down the, all the process, and also there's the problem of standardization uh, because if the data sets are all uh, in their own formats, it's uh, it's additional work uh, all along the way to trying to get everything to work together and. Yeah, I'm thinking about people from uh, awarding data, they probably struggling a lot with <laughs> uh, data sets in very different formats. So, yeah, the, the fourth point is uh, something not mentioned in uh, in the blog post, and I think it's something that's uh, yeah, way too neglected uh, uh, in my view. Uh, is the problem of recommender systems. Uh, I think uh, uh, a lot of the most effective uh, interventions that will have to be done uh, uh, especially during different confinement, have to do with uh, people's behaviors. Like, how are we going to, uh, yeah, are we going to keep social distancing every day? How careful are we going to be uh, when we touch different objects, op open doors, and stuff like this? Uh, can we touch our faces uh, less and stuff like this? Are we going to wash our hands and uh, more more frequently, uh, and so on? So all of this have to do with human behaviors. Um, uh, arguably, uh, this is the most effective treatment, especially to keep the reproduction number uh, below one. And uh, these behaviors are not going to appear out of themselves. There needs to be uh, constant reminders and encouragement to do this to save lives. And uh, recommender systems have a critical role to play in this, uh, in all of this. Um, so yeah, I've seen a, a, a video, it's in French, but uh, by a, a psychologist who was discussing this uh, yesterday and uh, insisting on, on, on the fact that uh, it's a problem not only of, uh, 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 well, having these behaviors uh, implemented out there, but uh, prior to this, uh, from uh, especially for, for communicators uh, out there, there's a big challenge about how do you communicate most uh, effectively? Uh, so, so psychology has a lot to, to teach us about this. But then there's also the problem of uh, how do you get these messages out there? Like, and uh, like we've discussed it many times on, on this podcast, but the, 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 the big channel today, uh, one of the biggest channels uh, are like uh, social medias and uh, in particular YouTube. Uh, and uh, a lot of what's communicated through YouTube depends on the, the, the YouTube algorithm. Uh, just to recap a few uh, figures, 70% uh, of the views on YouTube are results of the recommender system of YouTube. So if YouTube wanted, uh, for instance, there's an excellent video by Mark Rober about why you should uh, wash your hands. It's very compelling. It's very cool. Also very nice to watch. Uh, it's about how, to, I think the title is how to see germs spread. It's very educative, like with children and all. It's very really nice to watch. And this video has, uh, I think, 12 million views, which is uh, something like this. So it's uh, quite good. But arguably, it could have, it could easily have hundreds of, hundreds of millions of views. And, and this could lead to uh, actual uh, large scale impact, uh, a behavior change that could have a, a huge impact on reducing the, the reproduction number and saving lives. Yeah, so one thing that uh, I, I like to consider is to, to try to think of uh, how, uh, what would be the, the best case scenario if you can absolutely uh, decide what the recommended system is doing or for, for example, the one, or the one of YouTube and, uh, and, and count how many, how many life uh, would, would be saved in that case. So for, for example, if, uh, if, if you imagine the, that the recommended system is smart enough to, to anticipate the, before the, the, the European government decide to, 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 to decide the confinement for, for everyone, to anticipate that there is a problem and try to spread advice to the population that uh, uh, staying home might be a, a good idea starting from now. If it, if it simply uh, convince uh, 2% of the, of, of the population, which is a, a very small number to to, to stay home uh, two or three days before the actual uh, quarantine is uh, is set in place, then uh, this this has a repercussion in terms of a thousand or tens of thousands of uh, of lives that are of people that won't be infected uh, by by the disease. So, 
so it's huge. And uh, on the other hand, the an, an, another impact that it has, uh, the, the algorithm of today, when it uh, continues to, uh, to, to recommend videos that says, for example, that the, the virus is not worse than a, than a flu, and uh, and is and this seeing seeing these messages motiv motivates people to fight against the quarantine to continue to go out even though even given the situation and and clearly does not motivate people to 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 take the right behavior to to slow down the the, the pandemic right now and propagating these messages also uh, the the number of uh, life uh, negatively affected by these kind of messages is uh, is in the order of the thousands of the millions. So, yeah. so, so yeah. One uh, one thing that shows that a uh, recommended system is are uh, really important in this uh, in this in our scenario right now in our crisis is the the huge impact that they have on the on, on the population and that simply small changes of uh, of this kind kind uh, can uh, drastically change how how we are influenced by them. Yeah. Yeah, uh, one, one thing that maybe we can discuss is as well. Um, so the CEO of, of YouTube has announced that uh, uh, YouTube uh, plans on uh, removing videos that are that have COVID uh, content that are uh, too remotely uh, different from um, what the, the what the World Health Organization uh, recommends. And uh, this is uh, um, an interesting move, but. Uh, I'm not sure how robustly beneficial uh, it is. Uh, I fear that there may be a backlash because of, of this. Uh, and also like just the threshold of uh, not being consistent with what WHO is saying is uh, quite vague. And um, it may lead to uh, an, like unhelpful debate, uh, let's say. Uh, whereas uh, I, th I think perhaps a more Robustly beneficial way to move forward uh, would be to, uh, or maybe you do recommend a little bit the, the contents that are uh, extremely harmful, like for instance, uh, uh, like uh, thinking that uh, uh, drinking alcohol can help uh, kill the virus. Uh, yeah, that this is not going to be uh, helpful. This can be uh, very harmful. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Also, I think a, a more impactful and uh, consensual way to go to move forward is uh, to recommend a lot more the videos that are really much more clearly robustly beneficial. And again, I'm going to uh, recommend this video by Mark Rober on on the importance of washing your hands uh, because it's a very compelling video. I think many people who watch this can can tell themselves themselves afterwards, I should wash my hand more, and I will really try to do this, this to save lives. And if these videos get a lot more views, uh, I think this can be very uh, impactful. And this can, yeah, because a lot of the problem has to do with this mute news problem rather than the fake news problem, I think. Like the fact that this important information is not communicated as much as it should be. And uh, playing with this and trying, trying to recommend the videos that should make more views for, for the public good. Uh, I think is a better way to move uh, forward, and I'm hoping that YouTube is going to. Uh, just, just to add another layer on, on, on this, uh, I, I think the, um, I've discussed with some people on on these topics for like different like of recommendation for uh, or like the recommendation, and it's it's very subtle because sometimes you can have backlash if you recommend. So I, I believe you can do this without. Censoring, so as 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 uh, Vojicki suggested, so Vojicki, the the CEO of YouTube, he said that anything that does not fall into the guidelines of the World Health Organization would be taken away. So someone suggesting vitamin C uh, might help you. So uh, this vid, like these kind of things, might uh, be removed. I hope she reconsidered what she said in that uh, declaration, uh, because actually there are like uh, very professional medical uh, advice. Um, so. It's still it's still unproven, but uh, there are reasons for some medical professionals to to, to suggest uh, supplements of vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc, and and, and those things like do not harm. Uh, so, um, and if we enter that logic, uh, what we will do? What would we start doing with with presidents suggesting, uh, for example, like uh, 
disinfectants, alcohol, bleach. Uh, like there's now a surge of the word, like the surge on the surge of bleach, just as we speak now, because. Uh, and uh, so, so you would, you would fall into subtle situations where you can't censor a president, obviously, without a strong backlash. And uh, not only that, um, I, I think like if you enter the the the, the, the territory of, of let's de recommend or let's remove, it's not very very efficient. I'll give you an example. So now, whenever a video is talking about COVID. You have this disclaimer uh, from YouTube. Let's uh, please uh, look at what the health uh, like authorities are saying in your country. Like, please go to the World Health Organization. And this happens only when you have COVID in the title. So, for example, Alexander Technoprog did a video on uh, on deconfinement. So, the formula de like how, how deconfinement should work. You don't have the suggestion under that video. So, you can talk about you can talk about COVID without mentioning COVID in the title. And you won't have the disclaimer on your review. So you could have like a lot of videos under the radar, not labeled as COVID videos and having like, there's now a surge on a video reaching uh, reaching 1.5 million views in France, suggesting that there is a, a, a conspiracy of global governance. And that's like, it's of course talking about COVID without mentioning COVID in the title. So there's like a lot of problems like this, this, like what is a COVID video? But there's like something else. Uh, another strategy that is very efficient, which is instead of de-recommending or censoring or etc., problematic content, why not just flood YouTube with quality content? So yep. flood YouTube with uh, with Kotka's Act and the World Health Organization and uh, and uh, Three Blue Bro Blood, three, three Blue One Brown and 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 and, and, and Nikki Case etc. And, and like whenever you detect a high quality content, just promote it and and put it to the front. I heard yeah. might, maybe Lay could confirm that I heard that like the science YouTube now is suffering as a side effect. Yeah, yeah well, right. well, right, right now now uh, there's this COVID situation where science is quite uh, well re re regarded. Uh -huh. Like uh, like uh, uh -huh. like in France is the the most uh, like the, the the people. Uh, well, the, the the profession that people trust the most is a scientist, uh -huh. uh, and in this COVID situation, like uh, I think it, it's more or less fine. Uh, quite like, like they say science YouTubers do make uh, uh, quite a number of views, a bit more than usual, I'd say. But over the last few years, like it, it's been decreasing. I think the, the number of views for science YouTubers, uh, my number of views uh, certainly went down. But I've heard this from many uh, science YouTubers, and uh, it's such a shame. I mean, we, we could be pushing the quality contents up there, and uh, and there are some some amazing contents that can do a huge amount of goods, and that can also uh, just yeah, as you said, flood the uh, YouTube with quality instead of uh, of trying to to fight what's very 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 bad and letting what's just bad uh, go up. Uh, yeah, I think that there really needs to be much more thoughts about uh, improving the, the overall quality of YouTube. Like a lot of the motivations that I had when I started uh, YouTube was about uh, bringing quality content to people. And it turns out that these days, the bottleneck is no longer uh, uh, me. Like uh, the quality of my content, uh, well, it's still a bottleneck, but it's not the main bottleneck. The main bottleneck these days is uh, whether YouTube is going to recommend the content or not. And uh, I think it's a, a shame that uh, YouTube is is not promoting as much these quality contents as it could, um, especially in the context of a, of a crisis like today. Do you want to discuss the fifth point? Uh, yeah, we might, uh, we might go to the point uh, I like the most. Uh, <laughs> epistemology, uh, and I believe, I believe, I personally believe this is the most overlooked part uh, of where data science can help. So, uh, so our field, uh, the field of data science, is as it says, the field of inferring from data. So, so we tend to to have a lot of uh, epistemologic issues and methodologic issues, and uh, we think we tend, or like we, we should, we should spend a lot of time, or we're supposed to spend significant amount of our thinking into reasoning with uncertainty, with partial access to information, and uh, and reasoning on constraints. So what could I infer from this amount of data given the fact that I should decide within this amount of time? So though we, 
we, we, we are supposed to be the one of the fields that should practice trade-offs, uh, computational thinking, of course, but a lot of probabilistic thinking. So we mentioned the yes, no, uh, a blurry diagnosis where you could where you should also try to evaluate how uncertain you are on the yes or how you uncertain you are on the no and and how certain that the person is in the between region, etc. And um, so I believe that uh, the epistemologic contribution is overlooked, not only by medical, biological people, but um, biologists, etc. But also from like, computer scientists themselves, they tend to not realize how much precious material we have in terms of uh, in, in terms of epistemology and uh, thinking about thinking, thinking about inferring from data, etc. So who would like to start on that? Yeah. Well, I, I, I personally feel that uh, uh, probabilistic thinking is hugely lacking, and it, I think it's a big problem. Um, and so, typically, one, one thing I like to uh, I've been doing a little bit is to ask for uh, to, to, uh, different people I know about uh, how they view the future, like the, how how they think things will unfold in the next few months. And people usually answer with one scenario. They say, well, you know, I think it's going to go this way, or maybe sometimes they like, probably it's probably going to be this way. Uh, this is not probabilistic thinking. Like probabilistic thinking is about envisioning all sorts of scenarios and putting probabilities on all sorts of, uh, of scenarios. And this is critical because uh, I think given the huge uncertainty that there is right now, the lack of data about many different things, and also the fact that there's not a lot of data about deconfinement in general because uh, at the scale we are, there's never been a deconfinement uh, uh, in the past. Uh, we should be extremely uncertain about what can unfold. And this means that we should consider different scenarios. And maybe in some scenarios, th things work out fine, and that's good. But maybe there are some other scenarios that have a non negligible probability where things are, are bad. And maybe there's some uh, small probability, but uh, non negligible, that things go very, very, very bad. And I think it's important to prepare answers for all the possible scenarios. And the trouble with thinking that there's only one scenario is that you just say, well, for, for the scenario I have in mind, well, this strategy is going to work fine. So I think we should go all in for this strategy. And then you can start to criticize all the other strategies because they're not relevant for the scenario you had in mind. And I think this is extremely dangerous. Yeah, I find uh, what you say there uh, super interesting. Uh, this kind of... Uh of uh, things that you describe is, is uh, sometimes referred as a uh, as long tail distribution. So long tail distribution is that uh, it starts with a high uh, spike of a probability for for like normal average events, but then as a as a very long tail of a not negligible probability for extreme events. So uh, I guess the, the the kind of things that can be modeled by this is, for example, the the number of subscribers that a YouTuber can have. They, they are uh, uh, very, a very large number of uh, YouTubers that have less than 1,000 uh, subscribers. But uh, if you look at the long tail, the number of uh, YouTubers that have 1 million, 10 million, 100 million subscribers, mm -hmm. it's, it still has a non-negligible probability, and, but uh, there is less and less. And uh, this, this kind of long tails, the, the, the problem is that what we see the most Mm -hmm. is the the normal events that have high probability so uh, and uh, I, th I think I think now we can say that there is the same kind of distribution for for the number of deaths from a pandemic yearly mm -hmm. that most years it's uh, close to zero uh, or very small numbers but with uh, some probability maybe one percent or point point five percent there there is a pandemic that comes and kills uh, more than 10,000, maybe it's more than 1 million. And, uh, and it's, it, it's problematic in the fact that we, we don't see it coming because uh, what we observe the most is the small events that have a, that have higher probability. And uh, it's, uh, it becomes dramatic when we don't, uh, when we are not, if, if we are not making the effort to, to estimate the probability of these extreme events and uh, react accordingly. So the, the, and according, uh, a good reaction is one that correctly estimates this probability and then uh, adapt a strategy that is not 
the optimal strategy for the the most common case, but the optimal strategy based on uh, our all uncertainty about uh, all possible events. So, yeah. so yeah, this is very important. Uh, so yeah, in, in this podcast, we, we we talked about we talked in details about uh, what the mathematics uh, that is developed in the context of, of AI could help could provide, and actually, actually, it's already provided, already used in the like adaptive clinical trials. But there are a lot of lot of other aspects where 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 the thinking that was developed in the context of computer science and AI could could could, could help. Like very like this is very humble. Like without, like without without exaggerating how much it could help, but it could provide some some guidance into thinking with with large numbers because like we are now dealing with large numbers, and uh, maybe like among the fields of engineering, computer science like is the one that probably dealt with a lot of like that, that developed a lot of tools and like the toolkit of dealing with large numbers and the uh, restricted amount of time. Um, so I don't know, Leigh, if you see something also we could add uh, in, in this in, in this uh, in this avenue. Uh, and then I would... so, yeah, so uh, one thing that's interesting also is the the prime of, uh, of, of of having trade-offs in general and uh, and scarce uh, resources and you have to optimize given the resources what you can do. Uh, and also given how bad the situation is. Um, and uh, uh, I guess interestingly, uh, uh, a lot of the work about this uh, started in uh, World War II. Uh, during World War II, there was uh, a lot of thinking about optimization of uh, logistic res resources. Uh, this is now known as a, as a, a, a linear programming or, or you know, maximization in, in general. And um, um, well, so sometimes you can actually apply this uh, framework directly to some problems. Uh, so, uh, like for instance, one thing uh, that that will probably be important soon is uh, the problem of uh, of testing as many people as possible, given given a limited number of of kits of test kits. Uh, like it, it sounds impossible to say. Well, there's one. Well, you can only test one person with one. Uh, test kit. Well, actually, no, you could have a group testing. You could also have a prioritization of testing. Okay. Um, yeah, and all of this is extremely uh, relevant. Like it's about like having scarce resources and knowing that you won't be able to, to test everybody uh, because like it seems like the, the number of uh, test kits is not grow growing up sufficiently to test everybody. Uh, and because of this, you're going to have trade-offs uh, between you cannot test everybody. And so you have to selectively do your testing so so that in the end, like well, probably the end goal is probably to save as many lives as possible uh, while saving the economy and making sure that everybody uh, have uh, enough to live, uh, and avoiding wars and whatever. Uh, and th this creates trade-offs at all sorts of different levels. Um, yeah, we we've seen also the the lack of uh, thinking in terms of trade-off when uh, talking about. Uh, uh, contact tracing that uh, because it has it has a uh, some number of uh, of, of negative uh, negative aspects the first one being that it's not uh, perfectly uh, privacy pre preserving but as we discussed the the effort that are here do uh, a lot of work to be as privacy pre preserving as possible without reaching a uh, perfection and uh, and unfortunately uh, some some of the pushback simply consists to say that See, there is this case that is this particular case where the privacy preserving is failing and someone can get your private data. And then right away concludes that, so this is not the solution that we want. Yeah, okay. but, but I think that uh, they, they should, when making this kind of, uh, we all should, when making this kind of uh, reasoning to, to also consider the negative cases in case we don't use contact tracing. And, uh, and what motivates me to, to to recommend to, to use this kind of technology is that I see the negative cases in case we don't use it. Uh, yeah, this is sometimes called the counterfactual reasoning. Mm -hmm. Like when you hesitate, like you're hesitating about making choice uh, A or, or not A. Uh, well, it's called an A and B. Uh, so B can be not doing A. Uh, when you're hesitating between A and B, well, you should not think of whether A is good in the absolute or not. You should 
uh, if you do encounter factual reasoning, at least you should think about if I do A, what are the likely future scenarios? And if I do B, what are the likely future scenarios? And if uh, in the former case, it seems better than the latter case overall, or uh, it, well, then you should go with A rather than B. And I think this is very important for decision making these days. So yeah, like we mentioned a lot, the safety mindset. Uh, I believe the trade-off mindset is something also very uh, uh, overlooked in terms of the, the epistemology we need now to deal with this crisis. And in this crisis, we, 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 will, we will have to choose between a lot of bad choices. Yeah. So there's no good choice. There's like only bad choice one and bad choice two and bad choice three. And, there's no bad public reaction, but only public bad public reaction one, bad public reaction two, etc. And, <laughs> and we have to we have to pick the, the 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 it's like we have to face the fact that we are in a pandemic. People will die, so we just take choice that would have one thousand deaths, and the choice that would have ten thousand deaths, and the choice that would have a million deaths. And obviously, we should go for the one thousand deaths because we can't do the zero deaths. And and sometimes sometimes by wishfully like doing some wishful thinking and aiming for the zero that we might end up with the million debt uh, yeah. so yeah we, we have to maybe raise the awareness and pedagogy efforts on on the trade-off mindset uh, and the epistemology of trade-offs it's, it's not something trivial and like a lot, a lot of a lot, the problem like i think the problem with epistemology is that a lot of scientists take it for granted just like thinking, a lot of most of us think that thinking is obvious because yeah. we have a brain. So uh, just as the, the 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 normal human believes that thinking is obvious, that we all can think because we have a brain. I actually, reasonable thinking is thinking sometimes against your brain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is I heard this from an epistemological. Uh, I think I, I don't remember who would say like it say the. Uh, yeah, epistemology. Like, uh, the the scientific he, he called it the scientific method is is uh, not about thinking with your brain, but it is about using your brain to think despite your brain. Uh, so it's like a lot of like we we tend like we humans, and uh, I don't know. I'm talking for myself. Uh, for the for the majority of my life, I thought that I'm able to think correctly just because I have a brain. So if I if I, if I think, then I'm thinking correctly. And it's the same for, for, for science. Like a lot of scientists believe that they are epistemologically sane. So they are they ha their epistemology is correct just because they are doing science. And then yeah. and, 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 and we take epistemology for granted. So this is very general, like nothing to do with the trade-off mindset or the safety mindset. Just like we should not take epistemology for granted and we should not take the sanity of our methods for granted just because they are like scientists doing yeah. that and using numbers right. yeah mm. yeah this is the, the problem of overconfidence mm. um, and uh, mm. yeah i think uh, even in the scientific community it's worse elsewhere but even in the scientific community mm. um, there's a there's a lot of evidence that people are, are usually extremely overconfident mm. Uh, mm. especially when dealing with extreme cases like the COVID situation, I, I believe this, this is something that 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 should be that should be developed, and uh, like we should like raise the effort of making everyone aware of this in every field and every aspect of society, uh, and, and 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 like and also like like uncertainty awareness does not mean rejecting certainty, yeah. or, or like like not all uncertainties are equal. So like you you should have methodological ways to evaluate uncertainty so that you think within this uncertainty and and not just say okay there is uncertainty here i don't listen there is certain like uh, and, and then like the unfortunately like for journalists for example sometimes this creates incentives to listen to experts that look certain that look like confident and and and, and discard experts that do not look certain and that's like the problem is that like society might create incentives for people to look more confident than what the data tell them to be. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, just, just to wrap up. <laughs> so yeah. th this is also uh, known as a, a, a calibration, like uh, being able to assess how uh, confident you should be as opposed to how you are. 
and uh, there's a great app uh, developed by uh, Louis <laughs> about this called the uh, Base Up. So mm. Base uh, dash Up uh, dot Web dot. We'll provide app. the link. Provide the link, and uh, it's a uh, like I really recommend spending uh, ideally a few hours, but uh, at least a half an hour just answering the quiz. Like it's uh, just like quiz uh, trivia pursuit uh, quiz quizzes, but you have to answer them in a probabilistic fashion. And by doing this, uh, you can train your your calibration, uh, and, then, and I think this is extremely important. Okay. So yeah, one thing that I like with this app is that it, uh, at least it teaches you very quickly that uh, when you think you are sure at hundred percent, you are it's actually not a true hundred percent of the time. So yeah. calibrating yourself consists in uh, being being aware that uh, when you have one type of feeling of certainty, uh, how how sh how how true is it actually going to be? Is it going to be true ten out of ten times or eight out of ten times? And uh, and being calibrated is about to correctly evaluate uh, the ratio of uh, of correct over wrong that you use yourself as. Cool. Thank you. Next week we are going to talk about uh, trust and uh, uh, methods to make a uh, artificial intelligence system uh, more trustworthy. So this is a topic we already mentioned uh, here and there when discussing a. Uh, different uh, previous papers. So for example, uh, contact tracing relies on trust because we want as many people as as possible to, to be using it. But mm -hmm. also, uh, we in our previous discussion, we also discussed that uh, we build AI that is an algorithmic solution to take ethical decisions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is also something that, uh, that needs to be trusted uh, because uh, there, there is this intuition that uh, ethics is something that is uh, for humans and uh, only humans can do it well. And uh, it's sort of surprising that uh, an AI would do it well. So okay. when uh, when we build an AI system to do it, it's, it's quite necessary that uh, this also includes a way to uh, to convince us that uh, it's doing a, a good job at it and uh, that we trust the system. Otherwise, uh, no one be, would be using it or there will be too much pushback that this kind of system won't be used at all. And, uh, and then we, we lose on the possible benefit of it. Such a system. Good. See okay. you next time. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.